Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to Community Bookstores virtual event series. My name is Noah Mintz. I'm the store's event director, and Community is celebrating over 50 years in business. We credit the continued support of readers, writers, and translators for this milestone. So thank you all for spending part of your day with us wherever you are. Uh, I'm very thrilled today to welcome translator Daniel Levin Becker to celebrate the release of French author Laurent Mauvignier's novel, The Birthday Party, which is out now from Transit Books. He will be in conversation with the scholar and critic Merve Amre. Uh, now some housekeeping before I properly introduce our guests. We've enabled Zoom's auto transcribe setting. So if your version of Zoom is up to date, hit the live transcription button on the bottom of your screen for closed captions. If you have any questions for tonight's guests, please click on the Q&A button, which is also at the bottom of your screen to submit them. Uh, we'll be asking those at the end of the program, so please don't be shy. Uh, there's also a chat box, which I will be posting a link to buy tonight's book if you haven't already. And one caveat for tonight is that we're all at the mercy of our own home internet connections. So please bear with any technical issues that could arise and we will resolve them quickly. Uh, we have some stellar in-person and virtual events lined up for you and more in the pipeline. So head over to our website at communitybookstore.net, sign up for our newsletter to stay up to date. Uh, in instead of plugging one of our own though, I'd like to take this moment to let you all know about a virtual event that Merve is hosting that with Words Without Borders to raise money for victims of the Turkey Syria earthquake. It's called Words for Relief. It's next Thursday, March 9th at 1 p.m. Eastern, and it will feature readings from Orhan Pamuk, Leila Lalami, Maureen Freely, Elif Shafak, and more. Uh, I'll post a link to that one in the chat in just a moment. But now a little about tonight's guests and we'll get started. Daniel Levin Becker is the author of Many Subtle Channels and What's Good, the translator of books including Georges Perec's La Boutique Obscure and Eduardo Berti's An Ideal Presence and the youngest member of the Ulipo. And Merve Emre is Associate Professor of English at the University of Oxford. She's the author of Paraliterary, The Making of Bad Readers in Postwar America, The Ferrante Letters and The Personality Brokers. She's finishing a book titled Post-Discipline, Literature, Professionalism and the Crisis of the Humanities and writing a book called Love and Other Useless Pursuits. She's a contributing writer at The New Yorker. Her essays and criticism have appeared in The New York Review of Books, Harper's, New York Times Magazine, The Atlantic and The London Review of Books. And this academic year, she is a distinguished writer in residence at the Shapiro Center at Wesleyan University. So without any further ado, I will hand it off to you. Daniel, Merve, thank you both so much for joining us. Thank, thank you, you, Noah. And thank Merve, you. I love the idea that you wrote a single book called The Ferrante Letters and the Personality Brokers. <laughs> yeah, I wonder what that book would be. It's actually just personality typing all of Elena Ferrante's characters. <laughs> I think there's a market for that. <laughs> uh, Daniel, thank you for being here tonight and thank you for translating uh, this extraordinary novel. I thought I might start by telling you a story and maybe our audience a story about how I came to it, which was that I was in Bergen in Norway with Adam, the publisher of Transit Books, and among others, uh, Damien Searles, we were all there for a symposium honoring the Norwegian writer, Jon Fosse. And I had not brought a book with me and it was my birthday. And Adam ran and got me a copy of the birthday party. And for the next two days, I was reading it. Uh, every time we went to dinner, I would leave dinner early to go read it. Uh, Adam and Damien would invite me out for drinks and I would go and, uh, oh, I, Noah, you missed a, we're not there yet. <laughs> uh, cats out of the bag. I know, I know, cats out of the bag, yeah. Um, you know, they would invite me out for drinks. I would go, I would have a sip. Nobody saw that. Yeah, no, I don't worry, nobody saw that. Uh, I would have a sip of wine and then I would go back to reading it and my behavior got so weird and so rude that Adam finally made the meme, which Noah, if you could, if you could show it, uh, made this meme to advertise the compulsiveness, uh, the compulsive reading experience of the birthday party. Uh, actually, they, you know, Adam and Damien bought me a birthday cake and I took one bite and said, I got to get back to this better <laughs> birthday party than the one you guys are, the one you guys are throwing for me. So I thought maybe... What, what part of the book were you at when that happened? <laughs> I think I was at, um, well, I didn't want to spoil it for anybody who hasn't read it, but I think I was at the part where uh, Marion Marion shows up. Okay. 
own house. So I was right about at the midway point of the- so you, of, you already knew it was not an ideal birthday party. Yeah, but it was still yet, for some reason. And yet it was yeah. still preferable to whatever birthday party they were trying to set up for, for me. So I thought maybe, you know, for those who haven't read the novel and who haven't experienced its compulsive nature for themselves, could you like explain my bad behavior? What What is it about the story that's being told or the way that the story is being told that makes this, I think, I think universally everyone that I've seen writing about it has said that you cannot put it down, that you watch the action unfold from like behind your, behind your hands as if you were watching a thriller. What, what is it? Yeah, I, uh, I mean, I think compulsive, compul it's funny that you use the word compulsive because in a way, like I read this book uh, for the first time shortly before I started translating it. And then it took me tr translating it, going over multiple drafts, going over edits with the editors and, and now only now starting to come back around to it as a reader. And the word that I come back to often when I think about how it's written is propulsive. Um, so there's there's some pulse stuff going on clearly. Um, and one of the first and best ways that I heard the novel described was as a, a thriller in slow motion, um, which is to say it has kind of all of the conventions and hooks of a thriller. Like the it sort of goes about getting you invested in the characters very early on. Um, it skates between them in its narration in what seems like a systematic manner and uh, accumulates this series of like tiny cliffhangers because once you never leave a character entirely satisfied with where the story is and then it's already time to visit another person in a different space. And then uh, with this sort of mastery of the, the puppet mastery of a thriller author, it starts to bring them together and starts to um, overlap and overlay their conflicts and their desires and their motivations. Um, and while doing so, it gives you a sort of almost unthinkable amount of interiority and um, personal history about these people, why, why they feel the way they feel, why they observe what they observe. And um, I feel like I'm I'm still just giving a really general answer about how the novel is constructed. And I don't actually know what the sort of secret sauce is that makes it so compulsively, propulsively readable. Um, but they are all of the characters are very magnetic in their own way. And the fates that await them on this birthday party, which very light spoiler will turn bad. Um are never quite what you expect them to be. You can sort of see bad stuff coming and um, long delayed uh, consequences coming home to roost, but it never happens exactly when you expect it, where you expect it, how you expect it. Um, I still feel like that's kind of a weak explanation for your bad behavior, but... Uh, <laughs> I'm, well, I'm, I'm neither I'm neither a personality broker nor a Ferrante letter. So well, you are friends with my husband, so you probably know my bad behavior really can't be explained, I know nothing. explained or excused. Uh no, so maybe actually a way to get more specific would be for the two of us to each read a section that introduces the audience to the two, well, I don't want to say main characters, but the characters who make up the marriage portrait mm -hmm. in in the novel Patrice and, and Marion. So yeah. do you want to, do you want to start? Sure. But yeah, I mean that's I think that's another good point is that there are like it's there are a bunch of main characters. Right. Like there there is the 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 husband and wife and there's the daughter and there's a neighbor and then there are these intruders who will show up later. And that's uh did I say the neighbor? I think I said the neighbor. Uh, that's the, you know it's a very small cast of characters but all of them are so lovingly painted that um, sort of uh, it is irresistible and you're you're sort of powerless to stop watching what's going to happen to them. 
So for example, here's a scene uh, with Patrice, who is the husband and father um, who has gone into town. Uh, they live in a very remote hamlet in France, and he's gone into town to buy some some things for the wife's birthday party, which is happening that evening. And he's made a, a stop along the way, which I won't talk about. Um, he relaxes of his neck against the headrest, head tilted slightly back. His breath comes from deeper and deeper down. A heavier and heavier drowsiness takes hold of him. It lasts a few minutes. He struggles, pushes it off. It'll go on a few minutes more. He has to straighten up in his seat. There, that's enough. Now it's time to get going. And it's at this moment that he turns on the cell phone he'd taken care to switch off. The telephone and its messages. A text from Natalie, one of Marion's co-workers. Three words in a dumb emoticon to confirm what she already confirmed last week, that they'll both be there. Natalie and Didi. That they'll come tonight around nine, to which Patrice feels obligated to reply with two clicks. Thanks. See you tonight. Why he's thanking this girl he barely knows and doesn't particularly like, he doesn't know. But then he doesn't know either how he could like these two women who Marion goes out with so often, because he often has the feeling that his wife prefers their company to his. If he doesn't dare admit to himself that he's jealous of them, he can still admit to himself that he doesn't much care for them. He thinks or imagines they push Marion to hide things from him that he's never been eager to broach, even if he'd like in the morning or late at night when she comes home and she's drunk, to force Marion to tell him what she did with her evening, make her say who she saw, who she met, if she danced a lot and if she had fun. Oh, yeah? With who? Her stinking of cigarettes and alcohol and remaining hazy on Saturday mornings, and above all, silent. Each time he keeps quiet and has to make a considerable effort not to ask anything, even though she doesn't even make the effort to let him in on single detail of the evenings he's excluded from. And what he's most afraid of, the reason he doesn't like Natalie and Lidi, that her friends and co-workers are a kind of screen for Marion so she can hide more serious things from him. Maybe a lover, he thinks about this often. He imagines one day she'll leave him with someone else, for someone else, which already happened to him once with a woman who wasn't half the woman Marion is. And so, letting himself ramble along the grounds of the fiercest jealousy, the shadow of someone between her and him, he ties his brain in knots by convincing himself she'll leave him for this man who's already living between them. Because from the start, he's thought Marion would end up taking off, no question. She has no business being with a guy like him. It's as though the two girls are there to remind him that his days are numbered, that it's a favor or an indulgence Marion is granting him. Out of what weakness, what passing kindness. And he doesn't see when he comes home, sorry, and doesn't he see when he comes home from hunting, as he's placing his dead animals on the kitchen table, his rifle still smoking, his game bag with its overpowering smell of leather, the disgust he awakens, not only in Ida, but also in Marion, who stares at him in those moments as though she doesn't know him, wondering who is this man? Maybe that's why he does everything in his power to be pleasant with his wife. Why he always gives in, worrying without even knowing about what, except discovering that she could leave on a whim if he ever admitted how much he dreads seeing her go dancing and drinking. Knowing that deep down, most of all, something in him gives up a little more each day on trying to make her happy, and contents itself more and more often, if it can make her happy, with being pleasant to her, and if he can't please her, with indulging her. It just occurred to me that to get back to the propulsive compulsive pairing or distinction that there are so many moments in this novel where the characters do not seem to know why they're doing what they're doing where mm -hmm. their bodies seem to be acting independent of their minds where yeah. they seem to be watching themselves as if from outside their mm -hmm. own bodies or they hear themselves saying things that they feel like are sort of well-worn Grooves. I wonder if that has some relationship to what makes the novel so, uh, what makes it move so fast, or what makes mm -hmm. it read so, uh, what makes the reader establish such an obsessive relationship to it. Yeah, it's, it's like there's a sort of relatable voyeurism. Mm -hmm. Like you're 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 watching these people very close, like so intimately, more intimately than they know each other, and in some cases, uh, to your point, themselves, and yet very rarely is there somebody even the you know the sort of the darkness in the characters who will show up later on and intrude on the party like they're always moving always takes care to present what they're going through what they want where they come from in these terms that feel very human 
and feel very um, explicable. Well, so, I like the, sorry, go ahead. Go no, ahead. No, go ahead. Well, I like the term voyeurism in part because, you know, this is a novel where the plot, at least, is built around surveillance, right? People surveilling the lives of others before they impose on them in these violent ways. And you're just making me wonder whether, as the readers, we are being asked to inhabit <laughs> uh, something like the position of the of the intruders that we can can know the characters, we can watch them, we can observe them without their knowing it or realizing it. Mm -hmm. I think so, yeah. And I think, I mean, it feels like a little bit of a reach to say this, but I think there's a, a plane on which um, the book kind of makes the argument that by the time the intruders come in and, you know, fortified by the surveillance that they've been conducting, doesn't actually change much because everyone has these secrets and these secrets are all sort of inevitably bound to come to the surface through one catalyst or another. Right. Well, you know, when I read it for the first time, the the analog that I reached for or the 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 author that I saw kind of bred with the thriller was was Faulkner. So Faulkner was mm -hmm. the was the modernist that kept coming to mind. And, I, and as I've been reading the reviews, I keep seeing people say, well, it's like a, a seedier Mrs. Dalloway. Or mm -hmm. it's like Proust had written a thriller. And I'm I'm wondering what you make of that impulse the critics seem to have to marry these high modernists who are the kind of masters of interiority, of stream of consciousness, of uh, swooping in and out of different characters, points mm -hmm. of views. Uh, to the genre conventions of the of the thriller, what do you make of that? Um, I think it's a a critical impulse that's a very understandable. Like as a critic myself, when I write criticism, I think I also have this this urge to kind of use comparison to make this this new, hopefully new, unique creature a little more intelligible by yeah. saying, you know, it's sure it's a thriller, but there's no way a thriller would be 640 pages if it weren't crossbred with this other more, you know, high flown, uh, high modernist or experimentalist tradition or vice versa. Like, yes, it is a book full, filled with deep interiority, but what is it that makes it move so fast? How is it that you can't put it down, even though most of the time you're just reading these sort of uh, redolence from childhood creeping up through the radio or, you know, uh, cutlery on the dinner table. Yeah. Did you find your translation, did you find your idiom or your, or your approach to translation changing when you moved from one character to the, to the next? Like, is the idiom of Ida's interiority different than Christine's? Are they different from Patrice and Marion? Like, how do you, yeah. are there are distinctions for you there? There are distinctions and they're not um, what I would call systematic distinctions. They're not like um, each character doesn't have their own style guide, let's say. Um, but each character has little ticks of language. Uh, I think Ida is one of them. Ida is the, the daughter um, who is sort of experiences this, this party of captivity a little bit differently from everybody else. She's both on the outside and on the inside, and she brings a perspective of the child who's not supposed to really understand the dynamic between her parents, but she understands so much more than anyone thinks she does. And the way she talks, or not even the way she talks, but the way she's narrated, um, is a little bit more, um, I don't want to say childish, because she is this character who's wise, wise beyond her years, clearly, but there is a kind of simplicity to her language. It's a little more vernacular um, than Christine, for instance, the neighbor who's Parisian and has spent most of her life in the art world until she came to this, this rural hamlet to escape and just work on her paintings. She has a different way of seeing the world. And so obviously that comes through in this, these sort of close inner monologues. Um, same with Stutter, who's one of the one of the characters who intrudes later on, who has his own um, quirks that, again, are not quirks that you could um, map easily to any kind of, you know, function of language or class or regional 
register is just like something a little bit fractured about the way he talks and the way he thinks. And one of the things that's really cool about what Mauvigny does is there's not a ton of dialogue in the book, but there's a ton of seeing things not quite objectively through the prism of each character. And so that always inflects how the language comes across on the page. Yeah, I thought maybe a good way to model that. So you read a little bit of Patrice, uh, Patrice's section. I thought I might read a little bit of, uh, of Marion's. So this is, I'd say about a third of the way through the novel when she uh, is at work and she's preparing for a confrontation with her boss, her project manager. Uh, she works at a, in a print shop and she has you know, done something wrong with a copyright of some images and she knows she's going to be chastised for it. And she's preparing for this confrontation with the project manager who has spent you know, the past however many years she's been working there kind of moderately or mildly sexually harassing her. So, and this is her. <clears throat> and so no question, she'd tell them everything that was on her mind without mincing her words. For this, she has faith in herself. She knows what she's doing. And all morning, she hoped the day would go by without aggression or tension, the better to strike her ax blows into the conformism of the meeting, catching them off guard with her own violence, which would short circuit the hushed, civilized violence they thought they were using against her, because she knew they'd do everything they could to make her quit without getting their hands dirty by firing her. They'd respect proper form, protocol, a veneer of politeness, embarrassed faces as though it had nothing to do with them, contrite, reluctant to do what her own mistakes had forced them to do. This was the kind of idiocy she might have spent part of the afternoon thinking about. The day going by without incident, everything is fine. So far, it's neither malicious nor aggressive. They only know they're waiting for a meeting where the three coworkers will be chastised by a director and a project manager just waiting to come at them, guns blazing. She feels a wave of anger as she thinks of this creep trying to make her sit through 15 minutes of hell just to avenge all the 15 minute frustrations he thinks she's caused him. But it's nothing. She's been thinking for days now that she's ready to tell him in front of their director, face to face, that just because she refused to lick his balls doesn't mean he can take it out on her, knock down all her suggestions, diminish everything she says, sabotage her at every turn, just because I don't wanna lick your balls. She'd say it just like that something vulgar to catch them off guard, words like ax blows, bloody, crass, uncompromising, with just the right amount of acerbity to still the reposts of even the toughest adversaries. So much would they be taken by surprise. And if they wanted cliches, she could give them an earful. She'd grab the bull by the horns or less chastely, more directly, rub their noses in their own shit. They don't know it. They had no chance of even suspecting it, but Marion comes from a world where words work to wrap themselves into things as ugly and trivial as the reality in which they swim or rather splash about. She's not easily intimidated. No, she can get into it because she knows what she's done for this place and what it's taken from her. And I love the, um, you know, compared to that, that scene you read where you have a sense of passivity of mm -hmm. someone being you yeah. know, sort, along. Of, sort of a courtly lament. Yeah, yeah. And here you have, you know, her voice is so distinct in its defensiveness, in its yeah. anger, in the way it fantasizes about violence that I think that that almost primes us for what's, for where she comes from, right? For that mm -hmm. past, for where she comes from to intrude upon, on where she yeah. is. Yeah, you know, it dawns on me um, because the the end of what you read, the part where she comes from a place where words do this, where they work to sort of um, bear out some of the cruelties and um, savageries of the world, makes me think that all of the characters have these interesting relationships to language that are never quite on the surface. Like Christine is a great example because she's a painter and she thinks she, a lot of the book they have, um, a lot of the, the Christine chapters I'll say, uh, have these really insightful meditations about art and about creation, painting in particular, but just sort of like the struggle between the artist and the, the artwork. And uh, there's a little bit of an element of language in that about, you know, talking about your work 
she feels is often to impoverish it. And that was that was one of the things that she fled Paris to come here and not have to do. Um, less so with the, the brothers, but even the brothers, we learn, uh, the, the intruders who are brothers, we learn about their upbringing and the world they come from. And it's less, there's less of a focus on language, but it's always kind of hovering just out of sight of what we learn about them and their relationships to it and the way it's present in the world that forms them that in turn is is visible in the narration well your your reference to the painting just made me think of something else which is that when one of the brothers uh stutter uh, goes into christine's house and he keeps looking at the paintings that she's done and at first his impression is of something sort of terribly crude right she's painted this red woman and he keeps thinking how crude it is, how violent it is, how savage it is, but that the more you look at something that is crude and violent and savage, the more you see the way that it is formed and something beautiful, something arresting begins to come out of it. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if there's a kind of, I don't know, I wonder if there's a parallelism there between the theory of art or the, the idea of painting that's being worked out in that relationship between what is crude and refined and between the way some of these characters use language someone like someone like Marion you know the the repetition of that term uh, uh the repetition of the phrase you know licking his balls rubbing his face in his own shit there's something about her profanity mm -hmm. that actually ends up becoming in repetition uh quite beautiful yeah. Yeah. Even the way we see her a few times in her car singing along to pop music. Right. And even right. there, there's a sort of incantatory quality um, that very much belongs with that character. And you see, you know, Christine also, you see her listening to music, but it's instrumental, sort of modern classical music. And so she has this different, she's on this different wavelength. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, the yeah. other thing that I was just thinking when you went, when you said, uh, you know, that there are a lot of main characters I, I was thinking about how, yes, but there are so few minor characters or there, it, it's a sense that there are these sort of larger than life figures, uh, the minutia of whose lives and minds we get to know very well, but they are in a completely kind of isolated, yeah. uh, almost inhuman setting. And the second time I was reading the novel, I was thinking that you know, compulsive and propulsive weren't the words that were coming to mind, but there's a kind of like loudness of thought <laughs> that mm. almost felt like it was compensating for the fact that these people were so isolated and mm. that they were in a location or a setting that almost everyone else had fled from. Yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I like that. That like there's literally and figuratively so much less noise around them yeah but, um you know the listening to the radio or uh tv or just these little sort of um beamings in of the outside world to this hamlet take on this outsized uh importance but more importantly so do the things that are going on internally yeah well there's also an element there too of a kind of almost mythological or 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 mythic setting, you know, I, I kept coming back to the idea that these are characters who can't escape their own histories. Mm -hmm. Those those histories are always going to come back for them. Uh, accounts will have to be reckoned with. Is that what Marion says at the beginning yeah. of, of one yeah. of the chapters? Things will always have to be reckoned with. And I, I wonder what you, or I wonder how you think all of that contributes to, uh, I don't know, I almost want to say something a little bit outlandish, like the way that this novel thinks about free will or what we what we do and don't have control over or how we're bound to our own histories, whether we are sort of fated beings, like those sort of big out, big questions uh, come out of that for me. Yeah, I mean, that's, I think that's a little bit above my pay grade as the, as the humble translator, but uh, I think, yeah, I mean, I think he's, Mauvigny is very sly, yeah. because he's, he's working with a lot of big ideas, and it's a big book, uh, sort of crossbred with a lot of little books, mm -hmm. um, that at no point, and there's, there's, um, 
to go back to what you're saying about Stutter looking at the paintings, there's a moment where he feels really alienated by them. Like he feels in his experience in Christine's house, um, he feels alienated first by the classical music that she's listening to. And he's grateful to her because she doesn't even try to pretend that he might know who the composer is. And then he's looking at the, he feels this repulsion to bring in a third pulsiveness um, because he feels like he's being pushed away by the painting that like, there's just, he's being kept at arm's length because he's never gonna understand it. Um, but there's also something very attractive about that to him, something that he feels drawn in by. And I think that's a little bit of a metaphor for what Mauvigné manages to do in this book, because um, there are these very complex questions about human nature that, that get called into question and sort of uh, litigated mm -hmm. over this, this birthday party gone wrong. Um, but it never feels like that's what he's up to. It never feels like he's leading a class on ethics or philosophy or or human nature or free will or anything like that. No, and it also, you know, there were moments when I thought, well, is he leading a class about class? Mm. I, and And then my answer to that was, well, no, I don't think so. Because even though you have those moments of cultural exclusion or inclusion or what have you, uh, people don't behave in ways that feel sort of bounded by their by their mm. class demarcations. Like that seems to be, you know, that seems to be, those seem to be expectations other people put on them, mm -hmm. but they're always finding ways of evading what you think they might do based on where they're from or what right. they're They're not from. so much bounded by as, as haunted by the sort of um, partly external, partly um, reluctantly embraced sense of what their position is. Yeah, could you know? I was reading before we before we logged on. I was reading your translator's diary that Transit published on their blog, and you wrote in that that you took three passes mm -hmm. at at the novel, and you compared the first pass not unfavorably to uh to a kind of what did you call it which 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 language translation program oh, did you deep use? l probably yeah 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 i mean i i just wanted to hear you say a little bit a little bit more about about what you meant by comparing your first pass to a kind of machine's first pass mm. at the text. yeah so basically the way i break it down in this in this three part translation diary of which i think only the two the first two parts have been published um is that the three passes are the first is basically working as a translator, the second is thinking as a writer, and the third is thinking as a reader. So in the first, it's basically you have, and this, I think this is sort of a, a I did not come up with this, I, I don't, I didn't borrow it from anybody in particular, but I don't think I'm in any way the first per translator to have this, this schema. But um, the first phase is like, you have a text that is in French, and at any cost, you're just going to make it a text that is in English. And uh, I talk about how I did this pretty quickly, um, compulsively, but not in not in quite as joyous a way as we've been discussing. Um, not really slowing down to think about niceties of uh, style or even nuances of what this idiom might mean. And I missed a lot of things, thinking that the second pass would be where I go through and say, okay, now I have a text, it's in English, it's in crappy English, but now I'm gonna work on it as if I was a writer and think about um, what was Mauvigny trying to accomplish, what is going on in this chapter and how can I make it work at the sentence level to convey the impression that I get from reading it in French. And then the third, third pass uh, is reading it like a reader and trying not to th have the French in mind and just say, does this work? Are there things that still sit a little strangely? Are there things that clearly don't belong? Is there, are there repetitions, et cetera? Like really concerning myself with style. I'm so close to forgetting what your original question was, but I'm gonna no, keep no, talking. No, 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 I was asking what the, I was asking, you know, that first, um, the first pass, which I think you describe as resulting in a kind of warty, warty English. The word warty, yes. warty English, yeah, and I like that. I like the idea of a warty English. I, I, well, I was surprised that you compare it not unfavorably 
to the kind of translation that a machine <clears throat> might produce. And it just made me eager to hear how you think about the difference between the warty English that a human being might produce and the warty English that a machine might produce. Yeah, so basically what I what I say, and I've I've done a lot of work with machine translation uh, in the last couple of years, often taking a, a manuscript translated by DeepL or some other algorithm and making it read like it was not translated by an algorithm, which is which is actually really hard work and can sometimes be more con time consuming and difficult in a way than just translating something from scratch. But the point that I make is that um it takes me, maybe it takes me two or three months to arrive at this warty English version of this book that's going to need to be worked over a great deal still. And that's the sort of thing that Deep L, I could feed this to Deep L and it would give me a warty version of the book in probably 15 minutes. But the not unfavorable part is that the whole two or three months that I am racing through, I'm also kind of like... Um, I want to say impregnating myself, but I think that's a Gallicism. <laughs> I'm absorbing, I'm steeping in what the text is up to and the sort of the bafflements and the, even the things that I put off and say, I'm going to figure out how to do that later. That still sits somewhere in my mind and um, that will inform the translation that I ultimately write. And What were the bafflements? Yeah. What, in, in this particular translation, what were those, those bafflements for you? What did you find yourself really worrying or working over in the second pass some of, i would say most of it was just the way the sentences work because uh you you uh, audience members probably got a sense from the passages that we read but a lot of the a lot of the sentences are really long and not long in you know a proustian way necessarily but long in a way that feels a lot more like thought or stream of consciousness sometimes, which is to say that not only do they sprawl and kind of accumulate clauses and commas, and but they also switch back and they kind of um, forget where they were going, just like I did a few moments ago. That's how <laughs> impregnated I have been by this by this text. Um, but they'll sort of drop something and go on for several, you know, maybe twenty lines and talk about something else, and then they'll pick that thing up again and right. say like sort of. You can think of it as a text with a ton of nested parentheses, but the parentheses are invisible. It's just thought and like sometimes it'll return to something from 20 lines earlier. Sometimes it'll return to something from 20, uh, 200 pages earlier. And so just sort of like um, figuring out, making sure I knew what everything was responding to, what was um, intentional, what were things that you just have to have for French syntax because it would be ambiguous or misleading otherwise. That was the main thing that I did battle with. And then some um, some expressions that were not familiar to me, some idioms, some things that were kind of regional slang or just quirks of the way the characters taught uh, talk, excuse me. And um, and then I would say the the third category are just things where Mauvignet chooses even bracketing out the part where he writes these very long sentences that are not always orderly. Sometimes he'll choose to articulate something in a way that's not quite right. It's not smooth. It's not, uh, it's idiomatic maybe, but like it's maybe got two beats, too many of information. Like he could have said something, he could have streamlined it, but he didn't. And the way he failed to streamline it or just refused to streamline it is revealing somehow because it just adds these wrinkles to the text. And, um, you know, at no point in my three passes do I try to think like an editor because I'm not his editor. And my job is not to say, you could streamline this, so why don't we do that? My job is to say, what does it do to the French reader who is like everyone that you and I have talked to in any language, reading it compulsively and saying like, I'm not really pouring over every sentence. I just want to know what happens next. And yet there's a texture to the language that needs to be preserved. And so- well, Yeah, I think the crude, I mean, I think the crudeness is really part of the point of it. I mean, that, yeah. that there is, yeah, the, the, the excess 
that we have. I mean, we're, I'm just thinking too, that it's a, it's a setting where there's so much excess dirt, excess cow mm-hmm. shit, excess pig shit, <laughs> yeah. uh, where, where there is just a lot of textured stuff that is around these characters. And you do start to yeah. feel like the sentences themselves take on that excess of texture in yeah, you know the place. adjectives where you only need one or repeating the same thought in a slightly different way from one nested clause to the next or mm-hmm. looping three or four yeah. times back around the same thought like it's a it's aesthetic is one of I think uh, a certain amount of crudeness and excess but you know it's created that way as opposed to being sort of accidentally or sloppily that way right exactly like he's anything but a sloppy writer but i love yeah. i love this image that you're you're giving us of this, there's sort of grit that just sits yeah. very close to to the the characters and the you know the vegetables that are are these people in their actual yeah, well, even even the things that are supposed to be pristine and clean seem somehow dirty to me like the computer mm-hmm that Patrice mm-hmm. buys for Marion. Like I was sort of imagining like a dirty old, <laughs> a dirty old computer from mm-hmm. like the early nineties or something. Uh, or the the shiny gold letters in which happy birthday are spelled. Somehow those also seemed like dirty gold yeah. to me. Yeah, yeah. It's really shiny. I mean, that that there's a kind of um, veneer over over everything, I think. Yeah. And I think he plays with that a little bit. I think like he does, he does a lot of work early on and throughout the book to sort of establish that there's this kind of overarching squalor yeah. uh, that, that we're thinking. And then every now and then something will turn out to be brand new, like this brand new computer right? that, that right. like clashes a little bit with that feeling. And he'd sort of, there's also a scene later where, uh, as the birthday party, such as it is, is wearing on, somebody's talking about like, do you do you get cell phone service out here? And somebody else is like, of course. Why wouldn't we get cell so- cell phone service out here? It's not the middle of nowhere. Right. So there's little little touches like that that I think um, kind of square with this mission or this intent that he has that remains unspoken in some ways until the very end to say, reader, like these are what in the US we might call flyover. This is flyover France. These are parts of France that nobody ever really thinks about because they're not cultural centers and they don't have their own narratives. And if they do have narratives, they are narratives of desertification and uh, you know factories closing down and people getting sick and farms failing and things like that. But like, think about what else is going on, both in terms of modernity, in terms of the complexity of the people who are living there. There's just, there's a lot that, you know, should you, should you take the time to take an interest? Mm. Like there's, there's a lot of richness and uh, complexity. Yeah. Yeah. No, it is a hot, dirty, squalid, crude, complex, wonderful novel in exactly that way. I That's mean, the, a blurb. <laughs> well, I think the, I think the blurb that I offered Adam that he didn't take was that it's Faulkner meets uh, the 1996 Mark Wahlberg, Reese Witherspoon movie Fear, uh, <laughs> which also has, uh, you know, some of that squalor to it, to it, too. Baffling, baffling that he chose not to use that. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I might be the only person who knows that movie inside out. Um, <laughs> what was the title, the original title? The, the title in French is Histoire de la Nuit, which means stories of the night. Yeah, which is the storybook collection that Ida and her mother read together at one exactly. point. Why, yeah. uh, why, why, why did you guys decide to go with the birthday party instead? So we we really took our time going back and forth on that. Um, none of us loved stories of the night, and we tried other iterations like stories for the night, stories for the nighttime, nighttime stories, and none of them seemed um, quite right. Although, admittedly, like I think the title in French doesn't sit on the book the way that you might want it to. Like it's it is a sort of um, it doesn't let you know what you're what's in store for sure but it's also just like there a lot of different books could be called that mm-hmm. much like a lot of different books could be called the birthday party but there was i think some some menace that we felt was lacking 
or some besides the fact that just stories of the night sounded kind of blah yeah and we we proposed different you know all of us me adam and jacques from fitzcarraldo all um sort of came up with different titles to propose and almost without fail somebody would be like yeah that's cool but it sounds too adjective like it sounds too much like a game of thrones sequel or it sounds too much like a uh, arty literary fiction or whatever and um we were just sort of kicking kicking this grit around and then Jacques had the idea of the birthday party which is both extremely descriptive because that is the the core event and also you can read into it uh, an allusion to the Pinter play which right. has a very similar sense of foreboding and you know also has this dynamic where these intruders show up to a birthday party and right. wreak havoc on it right. um and at that point we we're like yeah great let's uh let's do that I think we were we were a little bit uh we were ready to settle on something but the long the farther away we get from that in time the more I think it was a it was a really good uh choice for the yeah title. I think they should change I think they should change the French title to reflect <laughs> to reflect I'll get Laurent on the phone and uh, yeah 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 yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm going to turn to the Q&A because we have a couple of really great questions in there sure. so the first one is from Katarina Fake who says uh, regarding what you were saying about the back and forth between the crude refined, how is this reflected in the individual sentences? I found the sentence lengths unusual and maybe parallel, short staccato paratactic sentences and then long exploratory sentences. Ah, we love a good close reader in the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, yeah, I mean, did you, did you find that the rhythm of the of the sentences varied in the way that that question comment is is describing them. Yeah, I do. I mean, I would I would love to hear your take on this also, but I think um, it's not importantly. It's not just a book that is six hundred or this is you know between four hundred and eighty and six hundred pages of just long sentences. Like he uses the short sentences. And also these very clipped passages of dialogue to really powerful effect. And they do sort of change up. Um, they pull you out of the hypnosis in a way and remind you that I think it's like it's a good surface level metonym in a way for what's happening between all of this rich interiority and the fact that the action that's happening on a very pragmatic level is just there's this drumbeat of things that are happening. And so the mind might run away to go 20 years into the past or um, think about an, an, an unhappy marriage or an unhappy childhood or whatever, but that doesn't change the fact that the action continues pitilessly. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I really like Katerina's observation. I was thinking too about how, uh, because the interiority uh, tricks us into feeling like there is constantly something, there are constantly words around us, uh, which is what I was saying earlier about the feeling that it's a oddly uh, loud novel. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I really love the moments of absolute silence. And I love how you get those in the moments in the dialogue, particularly with Christine, the neighbor, and the intruder who sort of holds her hostage, Stutter. And it's of course perfect that his name is Stutter for uh for this for this purpose, because there are these moments where she is trying to interrogate him and he is simply silent. Mm -hmm. And one gets the sense that he's not deliberately playing it cool, but he's rather afraid to speak. Yep. And those moments of silence actually give us something about the character without having to say anything, without having to articulate it necessarily. So I love how the moments of silence too are crafted mm -hmm. in a way that is both crude and crude and refined. Yeah. Let me get the next question. Thank you for that, Katerina. That was great. Uh, Michael Barron. Uh, which always confuses me because my brother-in-law's name is also Michael Barron, and I have to tell myself it's not the same person. Could we you don't tell know. 
you don't know, maybe it is. Could you talk about Maupinier's relationship to musicality in his prose? In this book, he writes in sustained melodic sentences. In another translated work, The Wound, the sentences are shorter, more rhythmic. Daniel, in translating the former, what, what are the challenges in capturing this quality? And do you know if this is common in his work? Another really great, really wonderful question. Um, yeah, so I haven't read The Wound uh, in either English or in French. Um, and I know my sense of Mauvigny as a writer is that this, um, what I was describing before about this sort of, um, what you very beautifully sort of described as this, this dirt, this grit that clings to the sentences and um, the jaggedness is, is something that he does to more or less pronounced effect in his books. Like that's, that's part of the way he writes. That's part of the way he gets at um, a sense of woundedness or pain or trauma um, in what he writes about. In terms of musicality, um, I don't know that I ever thought of it. I guess in some ways, like what we were just talking about, some of the sentences are too long to think about in the same way that one usually thinks about musicality in prose, because like a sentence, it's maybe not less the musicality of the sentence and more the musicality of like these sort of big movements um, that we've already discussed a little bit. I know um, he's also, Mauvignier also writes uh, for the theater sometimes. And I think that's, it's really interesting to think about him not even so much choosing a medium for a story he wants to tell, but like, uh, to think of him working in such a radically different medium where, you know, you have stage directions, but so much of the emphasis needs to come through in what characters are saying to each other, which is something that he does very economically and very powerfully here. Like, if you reduced this book to its dialogue, I think it would still be compelling. It would probably read much more like a conventional thriller, um, but it would work, I think, I suspect. I've never, I've never done this experiment. There are also um, these, there are also these moments in the novel where characters are rehearsing. That was the other mm -hmm. that's the other kind of form of interior uh, turning or, or reflection that I found very interesting. Like in the section Marion section that I read, where she's rehearsing how something will happen before it happens, and yeah. we get the the violent fantasy of the rehearsal and what actually happens ends up being a little bit different from mm -hmm. how she fantasizes it. But we also see that with the brothers, with the intruders, the mm -hmm. way they talk about or rehearse what they're going, what they're going to do. And I, yeah. I find that, that, that way of moving from the exterior, from what the body is doing to the interior, to one's imagination of what the body is doing or will do very, very effectively executed in this novel. Yeah, there's also a really beautiful scene where Christine, the neighbor, early on in the captivity is thinking about sort of challenging her captors and saying, you know, what are you doing? What do you want? This, you know, you know, it's not going to end well for you. And she is sort of going up as you, she's rehearsing it in her mind. And she's so dissatisfied with the way it sounds because she says, you know, basically like this sounds like um, kind of. Uh, boilerplate dialogue from an American drama series that's like it's been pre-scripted and it's so cliche and she's like I it's it finding like that discovery as a novelist I think is is a really gutsy one in some ways because it like there is this opening in the fourth wall that um sort of cast doubt on the story being told but it feels so true and it feels so relatable to anyone who's or as somebody who, you know, often talks and hears himself talk and wonders how he sounds talking all in the same moment, like to that kind of dissatisfaction, especially under the duress of trying to get a response from somebody who is almost certainly guaranteed not to respond to you. Like that's all, it all feels so, uh, so masterful and such a great example of the kind of complexity that he's capable of wringing from these, these moments that don't have to be any more complicated than just, you know, a hostage situation that you might, you know, flip past in, in 10 pages. Well, the gamble there is that the character will be like, I'm in a thriller. 
<laughs> and who so put me I, here? Yeah, who put me here? <laughs> How do I get out of this thriller? Uh, so it's a real, it's a, it's a, it's a risk that's being mm -hmm. taken there, and I think uh, he takes it really beautifully. All right, I think we have time for one final question from an anonymous attendee. Capturing the nuance of the various voices and maintaining these throughout the translation process amazes me. Me too. Uh, someone who is clearly not a translator. Is this something typically done in the first translation or in the later drafts? The consistency of each voice, which I think as we discussed mm -hmm. is, you know, the voices are distinct from one another, yeah. but distinctions remain consistent throughout those 643 or however many pages. Yeah, I think uh, to answer the question, it's a it's definitely not a first draft thing. I think the first draft is sort of, as I was saying with my deep L comparison, like even though I take much longer than a, an algorithm would to translate while I, while I'm laboring through it, I'm learning the ways the different characters talk and I'm learning their idiosyncrasies and their sort of language ticks. And um, it is a later draft kind of thing where you say, all right, like I never went so far as to make up I think I, I said before, like style sheets for these characters, but you sort of start to become familiar with the registers that they speak in and something that sounds true for Patrice the way it wouldn't sound true for Ida or for Marion. Um, and so later drafts, that's the sort of thing that you become more conscious of trying to enforce in a way and saying like, not only am I wondering, does this sentence sound right? Does it read well? Is the music such as it is successfully carried over from the way I experience it in French to the way that I think it comes across in English, but also is it true to the characters such as I have come to know them? Yeah. Well, thank you. Oh, Noah, hello. I'm back, it's very dark. Uh, uh, Sorry about that. Very dark, that's really <laughs> quite frightening. He's intruding on our birthday party. <laughs> that's right, I'm here to spoil it all. Um, Thank you so much for this. I really could listen all night, but I know it's very late where Daniel is, so we should let him get to bed. It's barely even midnight. <laughs> well, it's still somebody's birthday. He's, he's going to go out now. He's going to go out. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Uh, well, again, thanks so much. This was a really fabulous Thank you so much to both of you. This was a delight. Thank you, guys. Everyone and those of you at home, uh, please do consider purchasing a copy of The Birthday Party from Community Bookstore. Uh, we hope to see you at another virtual event really soon. Take care, everyone. Bye, guys.